Hi, I'm Oscar and I'm going to be talking you through designing long-term revenue. Uh, we are uh, experimenting with using OBS and streaming and Discord for this uh, just to make it all kind of a bit more unified rather than our usual Zoom call. So that's why this is a bit, little bit different. So today I'm here to talk to you about designing long-term revenue. Let's kick off with actually doing something I often forget to do, which is explain who I am. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to let my camera uh, go small so that I'm not overlaying all of the icons. OK, so first off. So I've been around in the games for about 24 years. I've been looking at all sorts of things, almost all exclusively online. Um, allegedly a pioneer in online gaming. Essentially goes back to uh, 1998 when I was working at BT Wireplay. Uh, this was an online gaming service. We, we did all sorts of fun stuff with dial-up modems. There may be some people who remember the dial-up modem era. I am one of them. Um, I was also the guy at 3 uh, who was uh, looking at games... Uh, at, at three so games in the java era we're talking about here uh you yes it may be hard to remember but there was a point in time where java phones ruled the waves okay maybe not as big scale as mobile is now but they were the seed the very people who succeeded in that era people who were selling games to me people like ilka pananen go on to form companies like supercell people like um uh christian Segazari go on and form uh, teams like uh, Super Mega Evil Corp. So there's a whole bunch of history and legacy out there uh, that come directly from the Java game era. Um, and I was at that. I was also home, home architect on PlayStation Home, the virtual world. Um, and I've been a Unity evangelist and a video evangelist uh, for mobile tech. Uh, and I've also been on stage a lot for the Pocket Gamer team. So I've been around a lot. I'm, a, I'm even an ambassador for a charity called Special Effects, which I'm a big fan of. But I'm CEO here at Fundamentally Games. Uh, and uh, our publishing, uh, consumer-facing publishing brand, which is Jetpack Collective. So as somebody who literally wrote the book on games as a service, my aim is to try and help us find ways to make better games. How do we, do, how do we make better games? Well, make better games by using smart finances, but importantly, by putting players first. This games as a service message is, is quite clear that it's now dominant. Something like 78% of all digital gaming is coming from games and service with a 12% year on year growth and that was just 2020 that's like pre-pandemic and it's exploded even more since then in January 22 only two of the top 24 platinum games that they have were not games and service so only two were not games and service so this is clearly a space where it were absolutely dominant but there is a lack of information a lack of knowledge about how to build long-term sustainable business models in games which is what we're here to try and uh, address. Again, if you guys have any questions, thoughts, worries, concerns, please feel free to shout. Uh, that's what the text chat's for. That's what the Discord chat's for. And I will try to respond to that as things arise. So let's talk about the basics. The psychology of spending. And that is thinking about why we play. Now, if we break down the core motivators that go on in the games, there's lots of different ways of cutting it. This is a way that I like to use. I, I think we want control. I think we want that sense of escape that comes from having autonomy in a world which isn't real. That is set aside from my normal world where I don't have the consequences of my actions anymore. I'm safe from what it, wondering about whether this particular game is going to affect my life later. I think that's one of the things that separates games from gambling in a profound way. Autonomy matters. Sense of control matters. The ability to escape matters. And that's just what I consider to be control. On top of that, we have completion. We have this fantastic part of our, our brain that wants to fit and match and solidify patterns. We want to create a list of football stickers and have all of the particular football stars of the era. We want to have... Uh, all the Pokemon, we've got to catch them all. We want to have all of the uh, things in the right places, packaged neatly and safely. That is an instinctive, playful nature. On top of that, we have social capital. We want to feel like we're part of something, that people will, you know, will look up at us, that we belong to the it crowd, that we are us, not them. And that uh, understanding where games and playfulness fits into the sense of belonging is an incredibly important part of why we play. Uh, I mean, I just have to think about uh, World of Warcraft, and I know three people who got divorced and married as a result of 
World of Warcraft. Um, and one of, you know, Hanukkah, I did a podcast with not that long ago, talking about their relationships that came out of this. And then the, the relationship they have with games in general. It's an important part of who we are. Digital entertainment. Games are a massive part of digital entertainment and part, actually part of our identity. Competence. I think this is another thing that is unique to games. We can actually demonstrate our skill, our ability to solve puzzles, our ability to understand a problem, our ability to memorise things. And we are immediately tested. We get instant feedback. We see people who play first-person shooters massively increase their capacity with fine, detailed ac action. That's an amazing thing that, that games has been able to help us with. So there are a lot of good things about games that are core to the reasons why we play but they're not quite the same as why we spend. And actually, well, why we spend is the same reason we spend money in anything. If you think about it, you know, bottom line is we spend money because we anticipate value. We have an expectation of future delight. Only by getting this thing will we get that expected payoff. Um, and that expectation applies whether I'm buying a pair of jeans or a um, hat of wonder in, uh, you know, Fortnite, whatever else it might be. There's an expectation of what it will bring me. And that expectation is framed by the game. Maybe it will be something material in the game. Maybe it's something that has a profound effect on my performance. Maybe it actually inhibits my performance, but that's something I want to make it more challenging and more exciting. But I get a benefit, a payoff for doing that, taking it on. Maybe there's an opportunity cost involved. Now, what does opportunity cost? There's a kind of fear of missing out, an idea of why should I act now? If we do not have a reason to act, if we don't understand the opportunity cost of acting now or not acting now, we don't act. So if you want to pay for something, if you want somebody to choose to pay for your in-game assets and you don't give them the reason to act now, they're not going to. You have to understand the opportunity cost for them, which is the two-edged sword. If they don't understand why they are missing out if they don't buy now versus what they are giving up by saying yes to your in-game item you don't understand what's motivating the player we have to be profoundly aware that we are not the only thing in players lives you have to be profoundly aware that you're trying to entice them into something but if you don't give them a reason to act now they will not do so and you've got to be profoundly aware of why they feel they're missing if they don't act. So moving on from that, there's also social capital. And this is again part of the same principle of why we play. We want to be seen to be good at things. We want to be part of belonging. We want to identify. People uh, get behind football teams in all sorts of ways and states and even different sports. Um, you know, American football is just the same as English football in terms of the, the amount of patriotism we have for our chosen team. We will buy the T-shirt. We will buy the hat. We will buy the whatever else it might be, the mug, because we are trying to show to others that we are part of that tribe. That tribalism can be a very powerful and potent thing and a good thing. It doesn't have to turn negative. But again, we have to be aware of the consequences of that we've got to be aware of the fact that we have identified the identity of the tribe and what it means in context we want people to be able to feel proud and excited that they are part of this experience and that's a really key thing we also have to bear in mind the fourth factor the fourth factor is the more complicated one it's abnegation what does that mean that means setting something aside i am choosing to set aside the washing up I'm supposed to be doing because I want to play Horizon Zero Dawn tonight. Knowing that that is a choice I have made that you as a marketing team cannot make me choose. You can only create the conditions in which me choosing is easy. So we shouldn't and cannot manipulate people properly. Long term, you cannot do it. Short term, we must not, should not do it because it has consequences and also frankly it's just wrong but you need to understand that you've got to live give people space to make that choice that they are going to choose to play and it's humbling when you realize that actually when people buy something in your game they're doing it because they chose to at the, at the heart of it and we need to respect that and we need to maintain that if we want long-term revenue 
Yeah, you can make a quick buck by, you know, tricking people into pressing the wrong button. You can make a quick buck by making it hard to close um, a, an ad screen. But in the end, it'll cost you. It'll cost you in the lifetime value of the player, in the, the passion and engagement people have for playing the game. So, if we think about what why, why people pay and why people play, that gets the picture of putting the audience first. We have to understand the audience, what they need and how it applies to our game, both in the way we acquire them, but also how we engage them and how we retain them before we get to the point where we can make money uh, from them. And making money, that sounds really cynical. I don't mean that. We're in an engagement. We're creating entertainment for players. We're entitled to be paid for the efforts. But we're now turning that structure in a way that players can enjoy and build and be part of. So understanding the lifetime value of the player is critical. Understanding that the cost of acquisition and it is a time frame between the point where we have acquired that, we paid for that player to come to our game to the point where they convert to spending any money at all to the point when that money that they have spent is offsetting the cost and increasing into profit. Fantastic. That's a pretty obvious equation. Cost, or customer acquisition cost versus lifetime value. Done. Job done. Easy. Solid. However, we should also be thinking about other things. Upsell. Now, there's, there's a temptation. Particularly, we've seen this temptation happening with subscription offers. I want the Netflix of games. Therefore, surely I want all you can eat. Bundle. Job done. Thank you very much. Ten ninety nine a month. Done, done, done. That's it, isn't it? No. The reason it isn't is because that stagnates it. It leaves no room for you to continue to develop the game. Games are not films. Games are not things which are done and that's it. You're not, you're not, you're not far and forget. We actually have to maintain them. We sustain them. We build upon them. And if we are going to maintain, sustain and build upon them, we need a business model that allows us to get additional revenues from those players who value the game, who want more from the game, who are going to deliver better value for the game to be part of that process. So we need ongoing revenues. We need the ability to upsell. I'm not saying you can't have a pay up front game. You can. But you can't have a pay up front game without understanding where the upfront where the ongoing revenue is i'm an advocate as many of you know for free to play but because i want free to play to be authentic i want it to be about why you are going to be engaged with this experience on an ongoing basis and even then even when i've got an ongoing revenue stream i still want to upsell i still want you to be able to spend more money in the game if i've got things that you value and you care about i want you to be able to make the choice if you want to I don't want to do that at the detriment of other players. I want to do that so that it makes every player's experience better. If you are able to play against other players with a new skin that adds new techniques of play, but not dominating play, everybody who hasn't bought that has also gained because they're playing with somebody who's introducing new mechanics to the experience. That's profoundly interesting. And then, of course, there's cross-selling as you add new games, new platforms, and so on and so forth. <coughs> so I hope you can paint a picture of why and the psychology and what we're trying to do, the motivation. Hopefully that will make some sense. What I'm going to try and do next is go a little bit further and start talking about how. So I think we need to break down our game into its <coughs> forms and um, types of good. Now, what does good mean? A good means the things that I, as a player, care about. So, for example, when I'm playing the game, I have subsistence goods. These are things that <coughs> I need or I can't continue playing. So, health potions, um, uh, fuel, things like that. Um, energy. But the trouble is, energy is a bit of a clunky mechanism. So, at this stage, let's suspend our disbelief for a moment. Because I'm not talking about how we pay for that. <coughs> when we come to exchange, we're going to see that it's not just about money. It can be about time spent and it can be about use of in-game currency. But let's stick with the types for now. So the type of, of subsistence or so energy or fuel or health, those kind of things. Then there's another type, which is shortcuts. So shortcuts are things that give me bonuses. Let me play for longer. Let me finish things quicker. These shortcuts could be a plus one sword. It could be a plus ten hat of wonder. Uh, it could be a number of things. 
these shortcuts are kind of important. These are the power-ups, the boosters, the things we can we can really kind of get minute uh, detail in the game. We've also got things like uh, social goods. So the skins that we have in Fortnite are the classic example. The idea that we can actually show people really interesting stuff and for them to feel like um, they're showing that their tribal identity. I think that's that's really key here. So understanding the <clears throat> the types and the forms really matter. Oh, and I'll get into strategy. So strategy is things like I have a fire sword, you have a water shield. Your water shield is going to inhibit the damage I do with my fire sword. Um, you know, something like a wood shield, I might do more damage because the wood shield might catch flame. So the idea of using elemental scissor, paper, stone like mechanics to add depth. One of the things I really don't like in these uh, kind of um, long term designs is don't have a plus one, plus two and a plus three sword. Because at the moment you have a plus two sword or a plus three sword, the lower level pluses are redundant. There's no need to use them again. But if you have a fire sword and an earth sword and a water sword, there are always circumstances where that attribute still has a purpose. And we want players to feel they've got value from the things that they bought or unlocked or been rewarded ongoing. We want them to feel like there's there's reason for that to still exist when we get to later stages. It might be diminished to somewhat, but it still has a function. And if it doesn't, then it needs some way of feeding that in to the overall progression of the, of the character. Anyway, four types. And they can be consumable, they can be capacity. So how many consumables can I own? They can be generated. How many consumables do I earn automatically over time? Or they can be durable. So durable goods or aspiration goods, as I like to call them, are items which I can own. They become part of my inventory moving forward. What's interesting about uh, the, the aspiration goods is that we might want them. We might have to do certain things to get to the point where we can own them. But... The moment we own them, they have less, almost no value. And that's not quite true, but they have a lot less value. They become a hygiene factor. <clears throat> Interestingly, consumables seem like they're worthless, but actually turn out, particularly around capacity and generator, where they become really important. They become the lubricant of the game. They become the thing where we can see the most value that the player has gained if they have updated and upgraded their generators and capacity appropriately. They get more value by playing more. I like things where we get more value the more we play. <clears throat> so I could go into lots of detail on that, and I have in previous webinars. Uh, I don't I don't plan to now, but obviously anyone can ask me questions on it. Instead, I'm going to go to the exchange. So I think exchange is something we haven't necessarily covered a lot in, in detail. We probably should spend a bit more time thinking about. Um, exchange is really thinking about that it's not just about the cash. It's understanding your game economy is what's driving your long-term monetization, not just how many dollar bills are being handed over. <clears throat> and there are various elements to this. So, for example, grind, time spent. Any time a player spends in your game is, is great for you because they are providing a context for other players they are providing momentum they are unlocking their engagement and trust with the game and if you can capitalize on that if you can turn that into an opportunity for revenue later down the line you are more likely to get more revenue out of users who played for longer we did a bit of an experiment back in the old uh, days back in 2014 when unity ads was just starting out <clears throat> And we saw that if you spent an hour playing a game, your average willingness to spend was around 64 pence. Sorry, 64 cents even, 64 cents. But if you spent about 10 hours of elapsed play playing the game, that average propensity to spend went up to about $15. Disproportionate increase. <clears throat> so thinking about the number of amount of time people play, having free players is not a loss. Having free players are not money on the table, as some people say. I'm not going to give you my thoughts on that but yeah i'm sure you can imagine instead they are the lifeblood of your community <clears throat> if they are sharing if they're talking if they are playing now demonstrating the game has value our job is to create the conditions where they want to do more <clears throat> this is where in-game currencies resources things like wood stone gold 
gems, mana, things which are exchangeable for other more valuable playing assets. Again, this lubricant mindset. <clears throat> Currency is an incredibly important thing. But um, we do want them to spend real money. Um, but of course, if we can use, for example, an ad mechanism, which is something she's done very much in, in mobile, but not done in PC, PC games yet, maybe not ever but well, i don't know i think we might see some ha happening uh, some interesting stuff happen with ads at some point in pc games but we are so far off that i don't recommend it at all um but never say never the point being is that what we saw that was really fascinating in uh, mobile was you could show what the value was of an item a resource in a game you can let people have access to trial a new weapon. You could get give them the chance to double the rewards that they got in a particular stage of play simply by watching an ad. Showing the value to them if they were to participate in that. Now, you have to be a bit careful. Don't get me wrong. You have to not try to recreate things uh, which are... Um, um, you don't need to become a tax, a burden on the player. <clears throat> But if you could find ways to say, look, here is some currency. Here is a thing. If you spend the currency, you get the thing. Fantastic. Oh, you haven't got the currency right now. Well, here's an ad that lets you get some of that currency to try it out. Give a taste of that process. What that's doing, actually, forget the ads bit. What we're actually talking about here is creating an expectation of value. Setting an expectation that there is a price associated with something. But that price can be earned through play that's great <clears throat> you then have to differentiate what things which are worth money or you know you know this is worth money why is it worth money there's a number of reasons why something might be worth money it might be because it's more powerful but then you're risking pay to win which we do not do in this dojo uh for want of a better phrase um we we don't want to create um a false expectation of value um but we do want to create an expectation that there is something here there's something special uniqueness scarcity is a really important part of that uh the way of being able to unlock something and feel like you can show off the ability to show identity can be worth money that's why cosmetics is so powerful but i'm a big believer that you need to have more than just cosmetics there needs to be some material benefit if, of play whether that's unlocking a new strategy whether it's unlocking some shortcut as long as you are making and maintaining the game balance, that's all good. There's two other items on here. The first one is um, anchors. Now, this is the language I use. Both of these two are language I use. They're not common, I don't think. Um, hey, who knows, maybe by the time we finish these talks, um, people will be uh, starting to use it more commonly. Anchor is something which I, as a player, have, um, have to get through play only. I cannot get this without playing. A lot of battle passes essentially are, are built off of the anchor principle. You cannot proceed in the battle pass except through play. You might be able to accelerate your play by buying other goods, but essentially, unless you have played, you won't get all of the elements. That's, I think, a really fundamentally powerful thing. It puts us at the heart of keeping the player at the heart of the experience and not skipping gameplay. You know, we shouldn't be paying to skip gameplay. The reason we're here is to play. Don't avoid playing by spending money. So, anchors are a saving grace for anyone designing a game economy uh, because it means that you can be a bit more relaxed about the maths. As long as you know that the anchor currency math works, the rest is not fluff, but it's, it's less critical. Ratchets. So what's a ratchet? A ratchet is, is essentially a kind of prerequisite that you have to have obtained. You have to be level 17. You have to have a headquarters at level 5. You have to have um, played a particular mission in a particular story. These prerequisites are a little similar to anchors, but they're more specific, more detailed. And you don't actually necessarily have to have earned the thing in play. There could be other reasons why you've got that access. I have to join a faction, for example. Anyway, um, so there's a whole bunch of things there. So if, if you think about how we can use those four, uh, those four types of good, those four types of form, and the uh, five types of exchange, we can now basically design any game system in a dynamic way. And that's key to our ability to create you know, delightful experiences in ongoing um, games.
So I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit kind of uh, maybe I don't know if it's abstract still, but probably a little bit more kind of like framing our mindset, um, and that is to look at the the living game thinking. So what do I mean by living game thinking? So if we're going to have ongoing long term revenue. We need to think about the flow of the game. So you have an event. Events are a thing. So that could be a daily challenge, a weekly uh, collaborative mission. It could be a monthly theme like Halloween, obviously, for this month. So what happens with that? <laughs> I might have a set of actions I can do when I turn up that day. You know, um, mine um, 20 gold. Um, uh, kill 30 goblins um, enter four arenas that might be my challenge that, that ticks me to proceed against some marker helps me unlock some ratchet in the process those ratchets can be to do with social unlocks they can be to do with rewards they can be to do with access to purchase items it can be to do with my progression as a player my ability to level up and add new characters new options and so on and so forth then there's promotions. Once we've identified events and the right cadence, the cadence, i.e. the frequency, we'll talk about frequency a bit later. Promotions. What's a promotion? Promotion to me is what is the call to action off of an event that motivates a player to want to spend money? What's the offer? What's the value? What's the buy one, get one free, limited time stock offer lasts now? Where's the FOMO? Where's the fear of missing out, the opportunity cost if I don't get this thing now? We need to build that into our events. You've got to think about that in a clever and smart and, and, and actually respectful way to the players. <clears throat> what I mean by that is, let's say I've got a big, intense, um, higher difficulty uh, mission or game mode. What if I've got that mode lasting for a week? <clears throat> the players in that mode are going to need more health potions. So I'm going to help them out by offering them a 10% discount on bundles of health potions. Now, that's a perfectly positive, very interesting kind of model. We've got in, say, this game mode is going to take you more, you know, going to do you more damage. By the way, you can go get some more health potions so you can get through it. OK, <clears throat> that's a, 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 a promotional offer that's deeply tied into the event that understands where the player is coming from, lets them proceed and results in a better take up of health potions, more revenue an upsell. Thinking about your long term revenue models in this way is incredibly important. It's not just about the individual purchases, it's not just about the bundles. It's about how you frame their expectations of spending. It's also being respectful of whilst we might have you know, desire to chuck lots of different promotions at people. We also have to remember that in, in games in particular, most people have kind of budget of what's appropriate for them to spend. And it's not going to all be the $35,000 spent in nine months of a particular player of X City. Yep, that was actually a real thing. Uh, one of the games I worked with uh, <clears throat> generated $35,000 from one person in nine months. And they were just showing off the game to their friends. They happened to be a footballer's wife. They happened to be a multimillionaire in China. They had the money. It wasn't an issue of money for them. That was a reasonable amount for them. The game was not designed necessarily with that in mind. They just wanted to play the game and wanted, and that's okay. What well, where we get into trouble is when we set these things up in a way which means that people who don't have the money try to live up to those kind of expectations. <clears throat> Let's just not do that. Let's make it so it's possible for people who want to invest in the game to get satisfaction from the level of investment that they can reasonably do. So, again, not manipulation, just satisfaction of wants and needs. <clears throat> then there's content. So, obviously, each week, I, I think week is the right time frame for content. <coughs> each week is new content, new things I can buy, new objects. And I'll talk about what content is in a bit. Then you've got features. And I think having something which mixes up the, the mode of play in the game that keeps it exciting every month is really important. Some games, it's every three months. Um, is it Pillars, I think, uh, does a reset every three months and then obviously all this has to feed into community your growth strategy and obviously the revenue so thinking about this as a ongoing pipeline of activity with an infinite you know no end in sight 
but still has to feel like there's stages, there's moments of delight, things to look forward to. That's the living game mindset. Let's talk about the game design itself. Again, I could go into this for hours, and I probably have already in other webinars. I'm not going to go into too much detail. I just want you to think about your game as layers. I want you to think about what happens in the core mechanic, the thing that you do. What happens at the context layer? Context meaning the uh, way that you drive a plan between sessions. Not just, here I am in a session, I get my start condition, my challenge, my resolution, my reward. That I do the things that I do. I'm in Fallout, I uh, find a monster, I kill the monster, I loot the monster, I turn the monster's items into crafted items so I can then go off and fight a bigger monster. That's kind of the mechanic level. With the... Um, the, the context layer, it's more, uh, why am I coming back tomorrow? Oh, there's another part of the map I want to explore. There's a factional narrative arc I want to, uh, you know, to, to, to take over and and, and, and uh, walk through. Um, I want to go through and discuss. So thinking about the purpose, I want to level up the progression. I want to see what the optimizations. how can I get better at getting through these things in as safe a way as possible. And also unlock my personal narrative, not just the game narrative for my personal journey. And then, so once we've thought about that kind of thing, that glue that keeps us playing for, you know, weeks, we've got to also think about the game in its context for the wider world. And that's what we call the meta game. And I think it's important here to think about, you know, the lifestyle fit, the the collaboration, uh, the competition, so the social elements of the game. But also how we create all kind of these zeitgeist moments, why people would watch our game. All of these factors fit into how we design our monetization model. If we don't have the ability for people to show off, we're not going to get a zeitgeist moment. We're not going to get people buying items, social customized items, because there's no one to show off to. Again, thinking about the layers is going to help us with that. I also think you have to think about the emotional journeys. One thing you'll notice from this graph, I hope, is that on the left-hand side you see relief, on the right-hand side you see frustration. As you move through each of these elements from you know, lifestyle, fit, purpose and start condition, you move from them to collaboration, progression and, and challenge. Those changes, those movements are taking me from relief to frustration. That's intentional. We want the player to have an emotional journey. Similarly, when you go from you know, challenge to resolution, you're going from the anticipation to actually doing and therefore the fear of missing out so understanding the emotional journey of the player how that affects the game design how that feeds into your monetization design is incredibly important we've got to think about how we do the setup the computation the resolution the consolidation of the narrative of the gameplay experience the personal experience of the game and how that fits into how we create reasons for people to care about the things we want to sell them and we satisfy wants and needs in ways that really matter to them. So hopefully that all makes sense. I know it's a bit kind of um, high high falutin in kind of some ways, but thinking about the emotional journey of the player is key for us to capture their emotions and offer them something they're going to care about because if they don't care, where's the anticipation? If they don't care, where's the fear of missing out? We have to make people care. So I said I'm talking about content. Content isn't just our assets. It isn't just level packs, avatars, card decks. Content is about collection. It's about progression. It's about a number of different things. So with collection, if we're going to have a situation where our game is going to encourage you to get them all, then let them get them all. Um, you know, if you're going to have a piece of content can you sell your outfit in five parts the head the arms the chest the legs for example you know you could use any individual part but only when you get all the parts together do you have a full suit and the full suit gives me extra benefits for some reason that collection is a massively powerful emotional driver understanding how it works now be careful with that our collections have to feel attainable if they're not attainable you lose a lot of people. If it's only attainable, if, if you go too far down the gacha route, nothing wrong with gacha, gacha is amazing, but 
Super Gacha, which was banned by the Japanese team, uh, Japanese government, sorry, for games, a long time ago, where the rarity is so much, there's as much uh, likelihood of homeopathy working as you getting access to that uh, particular asset. If it's so fundamentally rare, there's less than one part per uh, volume of the Earth's entire quantity of water. You think about the level of risk that goes in with that. Uh, you know, the so I'm just probably a very clumsy way of saying it, but what I'm trying to get across is just think about the odds. The odds seem too far fetched. You're not going to care. We want to be able to unlock these things. There is a risk with randomizing these things, but there's also a delight with randomizing it. Just for clarity, I'm not a fan of paid for random boxes. I'm not a fan of what they call loot boxes. I don't have a problem with randomness. As long as that randomness feels attainable and is something which actually is rewarding for the player. I want it to be a delight to discover an item that I've never seen before and try to work out what collection it's from. And I want to be able to then be able to purposefully seek the other rest of the item if I think it's cool. But if I don't think a particular thing is cool, I don't want to feel punished by missing out on it. So again, I'm going into a lot more detail than probably I should. But what I'm hoping I'm getting across here is thinking about the detail of what you'll have to offer in the game and packaging it in these delightful emotional ways matters. Progression, I think is pretty obvious. Tools that let me feel like I'm moving forward. I can unlock the, the Hat of Wonder if I'm level 14. Great, I know I've achieved something. I can show to other people and they will know what I have achieved because I'm wearing the Hat of Wonder. That ability for other people to see my progression is as important as my ability to progress in itself. Optimization, this is really important, particularly around growing games. I'm a massive fan of Fallout 76 and The Long Dark and games like that where you've got a lot of work to do to get your character up to scratch before you go do the next part of the real mission. A lot of time sync, but it's the time sync that makes the missions worthwhile. If I hadn't got to do all of that grind to get all my equipment and then to lose it all just to try and survive that big enemy, it wouldn't be as entertaining. So understanding that, particularly the hot dog economics of it, where you know, you've got eight hot dogs, six buns, which means I always need more uh, you know, more, more buns for my eight hot dogs. Oh, now I've got 12 buns. I need more hot dogs for my buns. Again, I could bore, for, uh, bore with you on that for ages. Understanding, you know, the optimization, the best path, the best track, understanding how the psychology of that works is incredibly important and is itself content. Getting my farm to grow as fast as possible as efficiently as possible is part of the fun playing a um a power wash game to get the perfect precision to clean that vehicle or that item in the most efficient least um, swipes way possible is inherently satisfying narrative is inherently satisfying unlocking things can be incredibly important we may not be paying for the narrative but we are on revealing the narrative the narrative bonds us to the things that we're doing it makes our things that we do have some sense of purpose and let's not forget that players other players are probably the most profoundly important piece of other content we have endless delight when other players can be there for us that's something that came up when i was talking about this earlier was the role of a wanderer so i'm a big fan of the wanderer it's a technique used by some early games particularly in the asian market where a real player who happened to be online at the same time as you would turn up in your game showing their outfit and objects and what they could do and they would add some stats to your performance based on what they had you'd have the name of the character you may not even be able to talk to them sometimes you would have set them as an ally so if they turn up again you get extra bonus stuff all of that stuff is reciprocated back to them as well. So they feel that they're getting stuff by not even having to be playing the game and they're getting some benefit and they're being seen by other people. Amazingly, how that very simple asynchronous method can make a massive difference to what content looks like. So, pricing. So we use the word premium a lot. Premium is not what we think it means. Premium means high price, high quality. It's not good value, 
it's high price. And the fact that we're using it for upfront games never ceases to frustrate me. Um, there are different pricing strategies. This is just an example of the way of looking at it. We also have to bear in mind that the price we set for a game sets expectation of value, and that's the expectation of quality. If you charge 70 bucks for a game, there is a specific expectation of what AAA quality I'm going to get from that game. In fact, it's probably 90 bucks if we're talking about a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox Series X game um, you know, from a, from a AAA studio. That is a certain expectation of quality. Well, a $14.99 price point says something else. It's probably an indie game. It's going to probably last six to ten hours in terms of gameplay. I already have a set of expectations of what that means. And if you price it wrong in the wrong category, you break the expectations. So we need to think about that. But in long-term revenue, there's another angle. We have to consider not just the quality bar, which is also important, but also the amount of engagement it drives. How we deliver more play through those purchases more value in play through those purchases so thinking about that's really important and what we must do not do is just don't do the pay to win thing i can see why it's tempting and the, the trouble is that there's a fine line between what's actually pay to win i.e you spend money you will therefore win the game versus what's perceived as play to win namely i get a 10 percent bonus on this gun which gives me this type of strategy that kind of strategy is currently winning because other people haven't twigged on the, the weakness of that strategy. That is not pay to win. That is not a nerfed game. That is the players have yet to work out the strategy and that's our job as designers to make that easy for them to do. We need to play with game modes. We need to play, make it interesting to play. Having items that add value to play is completely fine provided we do it where we understand the dilemma that item has with it. Don't just have a plus one sword. Have a plus one sword that's great against fire, but weak against water. Now, there are circumstances where the strategic choice of that item can go against you, causing you to fail. And if it's down to your choice, that isn't pay to win. If it's down to you making the right choice at the right time, it's part of the skill bracket. Again, you have to be careful. There are some ways that, that could go wrong too. But if you're careful about it and you plan for it, pay to win doesn't have to happen. In fact, there's no such thing as pay to win in my books. It's called a broken game. Let's just not break our games. So, um, not nearly there, nearly there. So I'm going to go into a couple of other things first. So think about packaging. Long-term value. Now, I'm gonna, not going to talk about bundles. I'm not going to talk about discount packages because I think they're pretty fairly common. What I want to point out here is that in each of these things, we're clearly communicating what you're getting. And it's based on emotional value. Season pass. Look at this. One, two, three. Look at the neon cosmetic pack. Isn't that exciting? Look at the toy box weapon. Blah, blah, blah. Isn't this cool? There's an emotional connection. Prestiging the Emerald Mine. Oh, we're going to get to keep this. We're going to get to upgrade this. And it's going to mean that we're going to get that really cool looking guy who's got loads of money coming out of his pockets. Do we want to spend the coins to prestige that character? Of course we do. We, we all want to be the guy with the lots of... I mean, I'm, I'm, you get my drift. The focus is on the emotion of the process. There's Labor Day Tournament. I'm, I'm in the expert. There's a fear for joining the expert thing. It happens to be an in-game currency fee. Remember? This bundling doesn't have to be about hard cash. It can be about in-game currencies, particularly when you're talking about gold, where that in-game currency can be bought too. It's still a revenue model. But it's important things about keeping people playing, but keep, pe like keeping people playing, keep, keeping people feeling like they're engaged in the process. Understanding your player's delight is really what it comes down to. Uh, Battle Pass I'm a huge fan of. Now, but I should be clear on this, though. I'm talking about the mechanic that keeps me playing and gives me more the more I play. I don't care if you call it a battle pass. I don't care if it is a battle pass in technical terms or not. What I care about is having a regularly released narrative part of your experience that updates on a predictable basis, that gives me something to do every day, gives me something to look forward to every week, and that builds it to a crescendo 
and that when it's done, it's done, and it goes away, and I've lost the chance of getting the other things if I didn't complete it. I love that. I love that to have a free track and a VIP track. I think that's an incredibly important... And when I say VIP, it can be paid, it can be anything. But these packaging tools, these ways of helping you frame for a player, yes, we have long-term revenue, but you don't need to be scared. You can actually plan what you're willing to engage with. But by the way, if you love this so much and you want to keep up selling, we'll have these other things you can join in with. Here's ways you can join in for free. Here's ways you can join in for other things which cost money. Here's ways where you can speed up your access to these things through money as well. That managing the expectation, packaging value, making sure players feel they're not overwhelmed is really important. And to build on that, we have to you know, remember Princess Leia's famous phrase, you know, the more you tighten your grip, the more star systems fall through your, your fingers. Why am I saying this? Because there are preventable pitfalls. If you make people feel they've got to come in every single day and by, without fail, always do your task because that's their job, you've lost your players. This isn't about a job. This is entertainment. We want to be excited about the daily, weekly, monthly activity or whatever the cadence is for your game. We don't want to feel overwhelmed. We don't want to feel dominated by those things. We want to feel emotional, connected to those things, not damaged by them. So... Let's pay attention to the player. Let's be careful to play. Let's realise that some players spending £5 a month is amazing and, and it's huge for them. And it's, um, you know, we should be respectful of that $5 um, dollars a month because if somebody chooses to give away $5 a month and it's their, that's how much they've got to spend on a game, I am absolutely humbled by their choice in my, cho my game. That's amazing. Same thing applies if somebody has the, the, the spending power and chooses to spend a thousand pound a month or ten thousand pound a month, which has happened in some games. If that's what they choose to do and they are able and willing and they are not damaging themselves in the process, I am delighted and humbled by that. In the same way I am with the guy that spent five dollars. I do not want to be in a situation where people feel ever that they have to spend that money. I don't want them to feel that resentful of spending that money. I want to provide player value. And that is what's sustainable. If we lose sight of that, we create unsustainable business models. <clears throat> so let's sum it all up. What is this saying? What have I tried to say to you all along? I am trying to get across to you that basically monetization, long-term monetization design is storytelling. We've got to think about the history of the game. We've got to think about the player experience. We've got to think about how we communicate, how we promote, how we market those elements. We've got to think about the, the communication with players. And we importantly have to think about the emotion and why they would share the value that they've gained. How, they, how will players themselves promote and market and make people excited about the things that they have bought? There is nothing more powerful than a satisfied player telling other people how much money they spend with glee if you can get people to say i just spent 10 bucks on this and it was amazing then we've succeeded in our job if we can get them to do that regularly consistently we have a sustainable business model for our game and that takes creativity it takes content it takes uh, experience it takes marketing it takes communication but it is in the heart of it storytelling it's as much storytelling as any other part of the game and it's all about this graph. You know, we've got to make our our understanding of our cost of acquiring customer offset that by a margin with a lifetime value and use that to understand how we sustain their engagement. And the longer we can retain the player, the longer we can let this graph to go out, the more profitable our game will be because we're building revenue models that are tied into how people enjoy the game. Providing them with upsell and cross-sell that allows them to build into other games that we build as a team as well. So, I think that's me done. I hope that was interesting. Um, I hope that was informative. Um, I'd be very open to any questions anyone has and please feel free to type away. Uh, like I say, if you're interested, if you're not on Discord at the moment, you can come and join us on Discord. Uh, there's a QR code there that should take you straight to it. Um, 
we try to do a lot of this stuff uh, we talk about uh, games game design not just us but trying to get other people in our game community talking as well um, and we we'll have an um, AMA chat on uh, Friday as well between 1 and 3 p.m. GMT if you want to come and talk to us there please feel free in the meantime does anyone have any questions for me Uh, just as a background, I interesting stuff that um, I had come up in the, in the previous session that we did. Um, we were asked about how, when, and um, uh, how and when should you look at the pricing value and cadence, uh, and how you calibrate that. And uh, my answer to that was basically that you need to do that fairly early. Um, the reason is that it's very difficult to set an expectation of value, um, and if you you've got to start high in terms of pricing because it's it's easy to come down in price it's really hard to go back up one of the biggest problems is when you find a team that's gone out and put a um a fixed price on early access and then really realize that they won't be able to maintain the game over time if they do that so getting them to retrofit a free-to-play model onto that is incredibly difficult and the only way to do that is to take the community with you it is a complete reset and you will lose people but you need to be able to sit down and work through how do you take them with you, communicate with them, set out expectations of value, how you're going to create that value, and make sure that they believe you and they, 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 there's authenticity in how you're trying to deliver that experience. Um, William, I will get you, uh, you'll all be getting the slides and uh, a copy, a link to the recording of this webinar as well. And obviously, you can come into the... Um, uh, Discord and, and chat further. All good stuff, James and Alessandro. Um, let's just see if there's any other questions on Discord. Uh, so yeah, no, is yeah. So all good. Um, well, thanks, folks. Um, hopefully that was useful. Um, obviously, like I say, this will go onto our our knowledge base. Feel free to check that out on fundamentally games slash knowledge base. Um, but also, you can just uh, chat to us on our Discord anytime as well. Great. Well, thank you very much. I've been Oscar Clark, uh, CEO of Fundamental Games. Hopefully this has been a useful talk about how to think about long-term monetization. And uh, basically it comes down to let's make sure we focus on what players care about. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.